Welcome everyone to the third webinar of Combiomed in collaboration with the Virtual Physiological Human Institute. Uh, Combiomed is a center of excellence in computational bi biomedicine. And today, uh, Jonas Lang, head of research of the University of Geneva, uh, will give uh, the webinar. He will talk about the lettuce Boltzmann method, including Palabos. So Palabos is an open source lettuce Boltzmann solver, um, which Jonas Lott developed, and now he's a product leader for the software. So before we start, I want to mention that you can ask questions. Uh, please keep them for uh, for the end of the webinar. So you can type in the question in the go to webinar control panel, but you also can raise your hand. Then we will open your microphone. And then you can uh, ask the question yourself to Jonas Lat. So uh, let's start with, our, with the webinar. Jonas Lat, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you all for the introduction. Yes, so as I mentioned, you can ask questions, which we will take to the end of the webinar. But there will still also be a little bit of an interact, uh, interactive part during the webinar, as we will ask you to participate and at two moments answer little questions so stay focused this is the third webinar in the series of combiomed webinars and i'm going to divide this uh, presentation in three parts so to start with i will take a step back and speak a little bit more generally about computational biomedicine which is the broad topic of our project combiomed what we are doing in the Comp Biomed project, and give you a bit of an example to illustrate what's all about, what's the big picture of the research, of the activities uh, which we are doing. The story here is that we, there's a whole lot of tools and techniques which we use uh, throughout the project to model processes in the human body. But one which is extremely important among all these tools is so-called computational fluid dynamics. And that's the topic of today's webinar. The second part of the webinar is going to be a bit technical because I would, would like to show you how we actually implement and um, develop a software tool to simulate computational uh, fluid dynamics with one particular method, which is called the lattice Boltzmann method. You will see that one of the reasons why this is a quite a compelling method in computational biomedicine but also in other fields is that the method is quite straightforward to explain to implement and to deploy on complicated hardware on sophisticated computers and because it is so easy in quotes this webinar is a little bit special in the sense that i'm addressing a broad audience there is no uh, expected specific background on your side and still we're going to go into a little bit of technical details into how really this method works and how it is programmed. I would try to um, formulate this introduction to Lattice Boltzmann in a practical um, manner, discuss pieces of an actual computer program and you will also leave this webinar with a little computer program, which is in the programming language Python. It is not a program which you can use for production or for research. It is very easy. It's just one page of Python. But still, it implements all the ideas which I'm presenting today. And you can download that program right now if you wish so, or after the webinar, at the link which is provided in the chat of this webinar. I'm going to discuss some parts of the program, but we just have one hour so part. Some parts will not be discussed, but you can have a look at it on your own afterwards. I will also introduce another more powerful software tool, the Palabos library. That's a software which we develop here at the University of Geneva, which is free and open source, which we use in production for computational biomedical problems. And I will show you two examples of how we use this tool in practice to solve problems in biomed. Let's start with an overview of computational biomedicine in general. To give you an example, I show you here a medical problem, which we have been approaching from several angles um, 
at the University of Geneva, also at Combiomet for several years, and which has led us to develop several types of numerical solutions. On this picture, you see a medical image of blood vessels in a human brain. And you see this bean-shaped anomaly, which is called an aneurysm. An aneurysm is a weak spot in a blood vessel, which causes some sort of bulging, a balloon-like bulging. And these aneurysms are dangerous because they tend to increase in size. And as they do, they risk uh, rupturing. And that's particularly dangerous, especially, of course, in the brain, where they can lead to uncontrolled bleeding. Uh, that's something that's very deadly or damaging, uh, which we are trying to avoid. Uh, that's a topic of a lot of ongoing research. So you see here this uh, bean-like object, which is the aneurysm. Once a dangerous aneurysm has been diagnosed, there exist different forms of treatment. And one form includes the insertion of a prosthesis into the artery, which we call a flow diverter, which covers the neck of the aneurysm. So this image here is taken from a computer simulation. And you see a human artery with an aneurysm and uh, a tube-shaped object, which has been inserted into the aneurysm here which is called a stent, that's a form of a flow diverter, um, which is inserted into the artery to actually cheat the aneurysm. So the diverter um, consists of a very fine mesh of woven wires. It's tube-like, but it is uh, not really covering the surface. So it lets the flow pass through. The purpose of the flow diverter is to divert the bloodstream from the aneurysm into the main artery, but still avoid cutting off the aneurysm from blood supply altogether, because if it would do so, the, there would be necrosis in the aneurysm tissue, which would be bad as well. And the end game here is that this procedure, inserting a flow diverter into the, uh, the artery, initiates, initiates a clotting reaction within the aneurysm that fills the aneurysm dome and prevents its rupture. Now, the role of computational science in this field is first of all of a fundamental nature because we try to understand the mechanisms that lead to blood clotting inside the aneurysm. And then there is also a practical purpose to computer simulations, which is that we try to propose an ideal shape of the flow diverter in a patient specific manner to predict if and at which scale blood clotting is going to uh, occur for a given patient after the insertion of a given extent. Regarding now the role of computational science, the purpose here is to try understanding the factors that are involved in blood clotting inside the aneurysm. And I show you now here the results of a study, which is a field study that was executed on a group of patients with aneurysms that were kept under observations. And this study was then coupled with uh, patient-specific computer simulations as the shape of the arteries and the aneurysms were um, scanned and reconstructed in 3D to create a virtual model. And then the pulsating blood in by these arteries was, simulating, was simulated uh, virtually on computers. And from this, it became possible to study the mechanical, mechanical properties of the fluid of the blood inside the blood vessel. And the study then made it possible to relate the risks of a rupture of the aneurysm with some mechanical properties of the blood, a property which is called the wall shear rate, which you see, which is plotted here on the right-hand side image on the surface of an aneurysm as a result of computer simulation. The study allowed it to conclude that if you extract the maximum value of the wall shear rate from the computer simulation, you can um, sort out a threshold value to distinguish between aneurysms that actually ruptured for the patients and the ones which did not. So you see that there is a threshold of uh, 30 inverse seconds, that's the unit of wall shear rate, below which uh, um, aneurysm rupturing did not happen. What's really interesting here is that the wall shear rate is a pure mechanical quantity which has no direct biological signification. And yet, in this case, it can be used as an indicator 
for the occurrence or not of blood clotting. Although blood clotting itself is really a biologic, biological event, which is a result of a complex chain of biological uh, mechanisms. This is one example in which we apply the field of computational fluid dynamics to obtain insights into something which is medically relevant. And that's the main topic of this webinar. Uh, computational fluid dynamics to reproduce mechanical, mechanical properties of a fluid, in this case, uh, in the case of blood in a blood vessel. Now, after we have used com um, computer simulation to help fundamentally understand the problem, and now that we have a criteria that have, helps decide whether a given aneurysm a, will be stabilized or not, we can take the problem from the other end and develop tools to help with the medical treatment of patients with aneurysms. The idea is that you, uh, we use medical imagery again to construct a virtual model for the artery and the aneurysm of a given patient, as you see on this image here and introduce virtually different flow, uh, forms of flow divergence into the artery. We can then use computational fluid dynamics to simulate the blood flow inside the artery and test the ability of the flow divergence to reduce the uh, wall shear rate. So you see here a presentation of the virtual and artery model and of the inserted flow divergence and the simulated flow field which, as you can see visually, is diverted by the body, diverted so as to not enter the aneurysm. This type of simulation is highly complex and requires a large uh, amount of computational power. Part of the difficulty comes from the fine structure of the mesh, which needs to be um, accu accurately resolved to be able to measure the flow through the fine structure of the woven uh, wires. And well, in this uh, animation, and I stop it right now, uh, we can see the simulation result after the insertion of a flow diverter. Uh, first, you saw the visualization of the blood um, streamlines that showed that the flow is successfully, successfully diverted and kept out of the aneurysm. And now what you see here is a visualization of the wall shear rate, which we signaled out as a crit criteria to decide whether an aneurysm rupturing is going to happen or not on the blood vessel wall. And you see that just visually speaking, um, the flow diverter is successful in the sense that the big values of the wall shear rate are inside the main artery, which is itself stable and not inside the aneurysm. This type of work requires a tight collaboration between different types of specialists. And at the heart of the procedure stands the doctors, of course, or the cl clinical practitioners who bring into the field their medical knowledge of the problem we are trying to solve. And on the other hand, they are also going to be the end users of the numerical tools which we develop in Compiomed and propose, as I described, uh, when we propose a tool for patient-specific decision making. A second part of the process is um, that we need our experts to understand the involved biological processes and the chemical reaction chain in the human body. In the case of our aneurysm, blood clotting can be understood more fundamentally as the fact that some of the blood constituents attach to each other, as you see it on this um, uh, image, and attach to the, to the blood vessel wall. And the fact that the low wall shear rate tend to stabilize an aneurysm is understood from first principles to the fact that the mechanisms of the biolog biological reaction chain leads to um, blood clotting. And well, this uh, reaction chain is activated only in areas of low, sh uh, of low shear rate. And that's the reason for the importance of reducing the shear rate through a flow diverter. This understanding in turn in its turn leads to a more advanced uh, computer model, on which we are also working right now, in which we simulate not only mechanical properties of the blood, but also the biological processes in the blood to represent the full process with better accuracy. Then part three in the whole, um, in the whole process is numerical modeling. 
we need to find a way to translate our understanding of the physical and biological processes into a mathematical language and then take this mathematical language to carry it to the computers and implement it somehow. And there are many different um, forms of numerical models which are able to do computational fluid dynamics. And the one I'm going to present today is the so-called lattice Boltzmann method. The fourth part is computer programming, which is difficult as well. And we actually need uh, experts just in software engineering and computer programming to address this task, implement the models, uh, the numerical models which we propose in the shape of computer programs and make them as efficient as possible on the available computers. And as we talk about available computers, most of the time, a desktop computer is not enough because, well, to make things even more difficult, we all, practically almost, we try to solve problems that require a large amount of computational power. And we get those from supercomputers. You have here a supercomputer which is called Pitt Steint, which is uh, situated in the supercomputing, the National Supercomputing Center in Switzerland, and to which we also have access in the framework of uh, Combiomed. That's, as an example, one of the fastest supercomputers in the world right now. And if you use it properly, with this type of supercomputers, you can run uh, simulations approximately 100,000 times faster than if you are using your desktop computer. But this comes at a cost because it's very difficult to exploit such a machine efficiently and to, re to write computer programs appropriately. In summary, there are many ingredients to computational biomedicine. And today, we are going to focus not on the medical part or the biological part, but on numerical modeling and a little bit also on computer programming and high performance computing, but mostly numerical modeling as I will present in the second and more technical part of this webinar, the numerical method, method known as the lattice boltzmann method. The lattice boltzmann method is used to solve problems in computational fluid dynamics. There exist different ways to solve uh, for computational fluid dynamics, and there are different methods which we use in CompileMed. And the importance of computational fluid dynamics in computational biomedicine is for sure that you have fluids everywhere in the human body. As an example, you will have, will find the blood or depending on the level of uh, representation of the blood, you will have blood plasma, which we want to solve in simulate inside an artery. There's the air in the lungs, which are for sure of interest. There are uh, the cerebrospinal fluid, which you find in the brain and in the cerebral cord. There are many types of fluids which in some way are used during inter interventions by doctors and I will show you today an example of them. And there are many other exam examples which require computational fluid dynamics to do some form of modeling in, in, uh, in computational um, medicine. Today I will present the lattice Boltzmann method which is a modern, I would say, approach to, uh, to computational fluid dynamics or complementary approach with other approaches, which is very useful when you are solving for complex coupled uh, physical systems, like this a system consisting of red blood cells inside the blood plasma. It's also very useful when you are looking for very complicated uh, geometries, like the geometry of the surface of a flow diverter, which has a very fine structure. And the last advantage which I would give with this method is that it adjusts in a very simple manner to the requirements of high performance computers. And this is also one of the reasons we use it here in CompileMed. As I said before, my presentation does not require any specific knowledge, but maybe it does require a certain level of affinity with numerical modeling and maybe a lot for technical details as I'm going to go into the little bit of technical details of the lattice Boltzmann methods, including the writing of a computer program. I will illustrate some of the theoretical concepts through computer code written in the language Python. And if you have not uh, already done, 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 done so, you can now or at the end of the webinar, download the example program, the link of which is provided in the chat of this webinar. 
to understand Lattice Boltzmann, it is good to walk a little bit back in history to the 1980s and look at one of the ancestors of Lattice Boltzmann, which is called Lattice Gas Automata. So back then, the goal of this computer model, Lattice Gas Automata, was to simulate a gas on a computer as efficiently as possible by modeling all the molecules in the gas by a virtual entity that's much simpler than the actual molecule. So you would take the extent of the space you're trying to simulate and represent it by a discrete counterpart, that is a certain number of individual cells that subdivide that space. And in each one of these cells, you can have at most four molecules, each of which is traveling in one of the four uh, principal uh, space directions. So that's four directions in the 2D example I'm showing here. In 3D, that's four. It is a Boolean model where you describe the state of the system by a sequence of yes or no variables, depending on whether you have a molecule in a given cell, a cell which is traveling in a given space direction, north, south, east, or west. And in this image, uh, all uh, existing molecules are uh, exi uh, represented by a green arrow that points in the direction in which the given molecule is traveling. Now, for something to actually happen, you need these molecules to interact. When one, when two or more molecules meet on a cell, they interact in a local process which we call collision. In this image, for example, two molecules meet in a cell and the collision leads them to change direction from a motion which was originally on the horizontal axis to a motion which results to be on the vertical axis. So collision in this model is really a very, very simple process. And that's due to the fact that there's only a very limited number of possible configurations of the molecules which you can have, as in every cell, uh, a molecule can only be in one of four states. And after collision, a so-called stream process occurs. And during this process, the molecules are propagated from their cell to a neighboring one in the direction in which they are pointing. Um, and we say that the collision is local because it is confined to a single cell, whereas streaming is non-local. It involves an interaction between a cell and its neighbors. But streaming, on the other hand, involves no actual computations. It's just a copy of some variables from a cell to its neighbors. And now, before moving on, I would like to explain the color scheme which we are using on this figure, and which I'm going also to use in the upcoming slides, which we're going to use systematically. So when the molecules meet, meet inside the cell, we say that they are incoming, and they point towards the cell center. And we also say that they are in a pre-collision state because uh, collision hasn't occurred yet. In this state, we represent them with a green, a green color, to distinguish them from the post-collision state, which is taking place between collision and streaming. In post-collision st state, the particles, or the, the arrows for the particles, are painted in red. Once streaming has occurred, the particles will um, reach the new position at the neighboring cell, and they will be green again, again because they will be in the pre-collision state on the neighboring cell. Now, there are more details to this story, and that's, but, okay, that, what, what I told you so far, that's essentially what lattice gas automata are about. And they were quite successful back there in the 80s, mainly because of their simplicity. But they have a problem of efficiency, because you really need a very, very large number of these virtual molecules to properly describe a fluid. And that's why, in the end, they are not so practical. They just need too much computational power. And that's why the lattice Boltzmann method came along, which is an extension of lattice gas automata, which uh, improves this uh, problem of numerical efficiency. And before I go on talking, I would like you to interact a little bit and give your opinion, or maybe just show a little bit your, of your involvement. So uh, instead of just telling you what the lattice Boltzmann method is doing, I will ask you, what is your guess? What's the principal idea uh, which the lattice Boltzmann method proposes to improve the efficiency over lattice gas automata? So it is now your 
um, time to, uh, to to interact. So you you have now a poll, and I will you will have one minute to uh, make your proposition of what you think that is Boltzmann is doing to improve on cellular automata, and in a little while we'll take on from there. From there. Okay, 70% now voted, so or 74%, so we can think I, we can close the poll. Oh wait, 83%. <laughs> so yeah, we are closing the poll. Okay. So Jonas, you can see the results now. Is it... I can I can see the results now, thank you, yes. Okay. There were three possible answers, all of which make sense. Huh? They were all of them were actually attempted, and there were there were things people were trying to do. So building, trying to build special purpose dedicated hardware. Well, some people did. Uh, that was not the solution, and we see that most of the participants also don't think so. Think so. And they will would be improve the model by inventing better algorithms, and this is also part of the solution but this is not what led to the breakthrough. The real breakthrough came with the idea that we should not work with um, discrete models, Boolean variables, but move to a statistical model, which is using a floating point variables. So let's move back to the presentation. Yes, I'm back at the presentation. So the right answer is, that what the lattice Boltzmann method is doing is that it replaces a discrete model by a statistical one. So, as I said, this is a bit linked to the fact that uh, back then in the 1980s, initially computers did not have the ability, at least not in an efficient manner, to work with floating point uh, variables. So these floating point capabilities, they were just upcoming. But in the 1980s, the computers were there, which had these floating point units that were very efficient. And the idea was to move away from an inefficient Boolean model to a more efficient statistical one, which is based on real numbers. To explain how that works, well, let's stay out just a little uh, while more with uh, the lattice gas automaton. So far, I've told you how to run a simulation, but not how to get any useful information uh, out of the simulation. So the simulation essentially produces these little green arrows, but the quantities we, which we are interested in are physical quantities, the velocity or the pressure in a given point and so on. And the link between simulation and reality is created through post-processing uh, as we take um, averages, for example, space averages as you have one here, over uh, the discrete variables. Essentially, we take one of these red boxes as you have it there, superimpose them to the system and compute averages of arrows, which you, you see as a result there, arrows with a varying level of thickness, which are real valued. Uh, those are statistical quantities from which we then extract the physical variables like velocity or pressure. Now, the idea of the lattice Boltzmann method is to say, well, if at the end, all we do is to compute averages. It's probably more efficient to describe the state of the system, system through uh, real valued variables, uh, statistical variables right from the beginning. And that means, of course, that we need to use the tools of statistical mechanics to find the equations of evolution for these statistical variables. And the resulting model turns out to be more complicated, but, um, well, it, it's worth it. So, uh, to jump right into the lattice Boltzmann method, let me show you again a 2D model which is used in practice. Well, in practice, we use 3D models, but for the sake of presentation, it's more, uh, it's nicer or easier to show you a 2D example which is also implemented in your, in your Python code. The model I'm showing here is called D2Q9 because it uses nine variables per cell to describe the state of the system. We um, represent again the variables of the system by green arrows. And each of these arrows represents an average of the discrete variables, the little green arrows which we had before. And we use now the thickness of the arrow to represent the value of that real number. In lattice Boltzmann, 
we call these values the populations. And the reason why we are still using arrows is that the populations represent averages or um, molecular densities of molecules which travel in a, in a certain direction. Now, additionally to the four principal directions, which we inherit from the lattice gas automaton, we use diagonal directions which correspond to north, east, north, west, southeast, and southwest. And that's a total of I of eight directions. And there's also a ninth population, which is introduced uh, for molecules which have a statistic zero velocity, which in some sense don't move. Now, when you run the lattice Boltzmann simulation, you first discretize the space, which means that in the simplest case, you simply overlay a matrix, which spans over the extent of the space to be simulated. And the image on this slide illustrates a 2D space that has been represented by an 8 by 8 matrix, which means that simulate, the state of the simulation is described by 8 times, 8 times 9 variables, which is 576 variables, which are all real values. And the distance between two cell centers, which in this case is constant, is called the discrete space step or cell size, and it is represented by the mathematical symbol delta x. As I promised, I will present some pieces of code in the Python programming language, which are part of the program which you were uh, able to download. And these pieces of code show how to implement the presented concept in practice. And these pieces of code are all, uh, so uh, the first piece of code here is simply a, a, a Python instruction, which is there to locate a um, big size of dimensions nine by eight by, nine, uh, by eight. We are using the Python programming language and a miracle library NumPy. So this command is expressed in NumPy syntax, which is very, very commonly used for numerical calculations in Python. You can see that we used a letter F to represent the populations because, well, that's a tradition and a common choice in lattice Boltzmann. Starting from there, Lattice Boltzmann essentially does the same thing as a lattice gas automaton, which means it alternates between collision and streaming cycles. During collision, just like before, pre-collision quantities, which are green on our picture, are mapped onto post-collision quantities, which are red. And I have here a little animation, which illustrates this point. So the green arrows, they move to the cell center and they collide and they become red arrows, okay? And you can, um, Imagine that during uh, the, this procedure, a statistical collision has taken place between uh, the molecules and assigns a new distribution for the velocities of the molecules in post-collision state. I remind, remind you also of the fact that the value of the populations is represented by the thickness of the arrows. Uh, the thickness of the arrows has actually really changed during uh, this animation, but you cannot see that because it just fluctuates very slightly and that's not visible by the eye. But, okay, so once again, let me remember that our color scheme is green for pre-collision variables and red for post-collision variables. Let me show you the animation once again, because it was maybe a little bit uh, fast. And this time, one of the populations is painted in gray, so you can follow it more easily, understand what's going on. So a statistical collision happens, which redistributes the statistical distribution of velocities of the molecules, which means assigns a new value to the nine populations. And the populations then enter something which we call the pre, the post-collision state, which is red. This collision step is followed by the streaming step, step which is really exactly the same thing as in lattice gas I, I automaton. We take the populations in their post-collision state, which is red. We copy them to the neighbors in their direction of propagation. And I think we have a little animation here again, where you see how they are propagated and become green again, because at the neighboring cell, they reach a pre-collision state at the next time step. This also means that the time advances in a discontinuous manner. And it advances by discrete, a discrete quantity, which we call delta t. Um, and delta t, really, so the time advances by a discrete step delta t 
a dairy um, stream extender. The streaming step is just a little bit tricky to implement because all the cells are uh, streaming their populations at the same time, and you must avoid that they overwrite each other in a non-controlled manner. So in our example, Python code, we solve this problem very simply by actually allocating two matrices, one for the green populations and one for the red populations. So the green populations, we call them F in, and the red populations, we call them F out. That's not something we do in the production code because it uses a lot of memory but that's what we do for the purpose of illustration in this simple Python code. And maybe for the first time now, let's not only talk about computer algorithms, but also about physics. And let's see how to compute the physical properties which we want to measure in the end and obtain from a simulation. If we simulate a gas, one quantity of interest is the density of the gas at every point in space. And uh, this quantity, we simply um, um, obtain it by well, choosing a cell which is close to this point in space and carry out a sum of overall populations inside this cell. So this gives us a sum of all partial densities of molecules traveling in a given direction. And the result is the total molecular density. And the Python code, well, that's a one-liner, like many other things in this code, is to say that take uh, the matrix, which is uh, the green incoming populations, carry out a sum over the first index, which is the index running from zero to eight for all populations. And as a re result, we get a matrix that contains the density at every point in uh, space. And the next quantity of interest is the physical uh, pressure. And if you are in a gas, the pressure relates to the density through an equation of state. And this lattice Boltzmann method, this lattice Boltzmann model, which we call D2Q9, has its own equation of state, which has more of a numerical significance, which says, which states that the pressure is proportional to the density, and the proportionality constant is a constant that is known and has a numerical signification. And of course, blood is a liquid on the gas, and we don't expect the density to actually change inside the blood. But with the lattice Boltzmann method, we use a numerical trick, which is to say that we solve for a quantity which is called the density anyway, which has not a physical, but just a numerical meaning. And we exploit this virtual density as a way to compute the pressure in a cheap manner and through, well, the numerical equation of state. So these way to compute the pressure in lattice Poisson will be used both for gases and for liquids. And as the final and probably most important quantity, I would like to introduce the flow velocity, which again is space dependent. The velocity is a vector quantity, which we compute again like the density as a sum over the populations, but this time this is a weighted sum. And um, I show you now first the weights which we associate to each of the directions um, before showing you the formula. So these weights are again vector quantities and they are simply equal to the vectors which connect a cell center to one of its neighbors. Take for an example the population uh, which corresponds to the um, northwest population and um, for this direction for, um, I said northwest, right? So that's uh, the one which uh, on this picture is called uh, V6. So that's just a vector quantity which has two components. The X component will be minus one, and the Y component will be plus one. So we have a V a constant, a vector constant associated to each direction. And velocity, the free flow velocity, is just a weighted sum over the populations, weighted by the uh, vector constant vi. We then divide by the density because this sum really computes momentum and not uh, velocity. And we multiply the whole thing by delta x over delta t to get the proper physical units of velocity. In the Python code, this time this is not a one-liner, but just five lines of code, we allocate a matrix which is a 2 pi nx by ny. In our example, that would be 2 by 8 by eight and do a loop over the nine directions to add the corresponding populations 
to develop all the matrix and weight, weight the whole thing by the uh, lattice constant V, in the end, divide the whole thing by rho. So again, computing the velocity is a very simple procedure. The last thing I have to tell you about, and then we are actually done with this presentation of the lattice Bonson method, is how to compute um, the collision term. And the collision term, there are many different collision terms. It depends on the physics you want to represent, right? Uh, there is one collision term many people use, and we use mostly also for the projects which we have in Compiomed, that's called a BGK model. And it's based on the observation that the distribution of molecular velocities in the gas does not really change a lot in practice. It is always close to an equilibrium state, which is distributed, which is um, re which is represented by uh, an expression which is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation, uh, the Maxwell uh, the Maxwell the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So that would be um, a distribution of velocities which depends on nothing else than the local density at the local velocity of the gas at a given point in space. And the BGK model, what it does is it says, well, the physics of our fluid is to relax towards this equilibrium. So what we do is we take, we take the density, the velocity, we compute the equilibrium term, and then we relax the population. So we take the difference between incoming and outgoing, outgoing populations and say that this well is proportional to the difference between the populations and their equilibrium, equilibrium state. And this constant, which we call omega here, which expresses the proportionality, relates to the fluid viscosity. So this allows us to adjust the fluid viscosity. I should now give you the details of how we compute the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. But OK, we are running out of time. And this is just a very short introduction to the Maxwell-Boltzmann method. I will give you a link at the end of this webinar to a MOOC, actually, in which you can have all the details. And of course, you also have the details in the Python code which we downloaded by that. Uh, for now, let's uh, stay here. So we switch to the Python code, and this is the collision uh, formula which I expressed in Python. This is just a one liner again. We say that the outgoing populations are equal to the incoming ones minus omega, that's the relaxation frequency, one constant times difference between uh, incoming populations and equilibrium. And um, I, I, I feel that I'm, I'm losing the focus a little bit. I'll just drink a little bit of coffee, sorry for that. Okay, I'm back. So, uh, because I, talk, uh, I spoke about the computer implementation of the collision step, let's also talk about the computer implementation of the streaming step, which I remind you, takes a system from time t to time t plus delta t and streams outgoing red populations to neighboring incoming green populations. So in Python, this will be essentially, uh, well, depending on how you define this, a one-liner or a three -liner or four-liner. So there's no compute computation involved here. You take the outgoing populations and you shift them in space directions, which are defined by the v constants, and this gives you the incoming populations at the next time step. You have a Python program which you can use to experiment with the lattice Boltzmann method. It does solve interesting problems, but it is not powerful enough to solve one of the problems we would like to address in Compiomed. It is not very efficient, it is not parallel, it does not implement all the models we want. So instead in Compiomed we use a software which is open source and free, which we actually develop, develop here at the University of Geneva, which is called Palamos. So that's also one which you can download and use for your own purposes, but of course it's much more technical and more difficult also to use than the Python script which we are using here for the purpose for the sake of illustration. The Palabos software was used, for example, for the computer simulations, which I showed you in the beginning, of a blood flow inside an artery with a flow diverter. A second and final example of um, application of the Palabos software inside the Compiomet project I would like to show you is a so-called um, simulation of vertebroplasty. So, the problem which we are having here, the medical problem, is that a, problem, a person has 
a compression fracture in a vertebra. And a way to treat this is vertebroplasty, which is that the doctor takes a syringe, which is filled with cement, and injects the cement into the vertebra to stabilize it. And this is, of course, a dangerous uh, procedure because that's a region of the body where you don't want the, um, the cement to spill out of the vertebra because it would damage, damage some parts of the body. That's a case where a patient-specific simulation can be extremely useful because what we can do is we uh, set up, a, again, a virtual model of a patient-specific vertebra. So you have here a image which is coming from a computer simulation and represent uh, a cut through a virtual uh, bone of a given patient. You can see that it has a very complicated porous structure. And then we simulate, I have a movie here, we simulate the uh, injection of cement into uh, the bone. And this makes it possible to decide whether or at which point the cement should be injected and which quantity of cement should be injected in a patient uh, specific manner. So this is of course data which we compared also with experiments. So uh, we have bones in this case, not from living but from deceased patients, which were used also to do uh, experimental injection of cement and uh, compare the results with computer simulation. You see here a, a given bone in which um, cement was injected in experimentally on the left and numerically on the right. And you see that uh, the cement is spilling out of the bone at the same place after the injection of the same quantity, which is three milliliters of cement. Can we really do real time to predict some data of use for a given patient? When we take this, take this simulation and just run it, we run it on a computer which is a supercomputer but of modest size, not the one which you saw which is at the supercomputing center, but the one which is part of the uh, local facilities which we have here at, um, at the university. So that's a computer on which, for example, we use a total of 256 CPU cores. And in this case, we observe that it takes more than 30 hours to simulate cement injection, which is a bit slow, right? To make uh, real-time uh, decisions or to provide real-time decisions to a doctor, to a practitioner treating a patient. So um, this is uh, the last point I'm making. We Part of our work is to, high perform is to do high-performance computing, which is to find tricks to speed up uh, simulations. And well, that's, that's the last time where I ask you for your input, what do you think? what is the trick which we used in this um, case successfully to speed up the simulation uh, substantially. So let's see, the poll has already popped up. So you have three uh, possibilities, which are A, allocate only areas which are filled by cement, but allocate those dynamically, or cheat with the parameters, increase the viscosity to a wrong value so that the whole thing converges faster, or use something which would be an inhomogeneous mesh to, uh, so that the fluid matches the pore sizes inside the bone. What do you think? I will uh, let give you a little bit of time to vote. Of course, none of the answers are wrong, but there is one of the three which we were able to successfully implement. Okay, 88% voted, so I think we can close the poll now, see the results. Can you see the results, Jonas? I can see the results, yes. I hope that the 12% who did not vote are not sleeping. But um, anyway, we are uh, approaching the end of the presentation right now. So 62% uh, uh, voted for uh, the, in quotes, right answer. That's what we actually did, which is to, I will show you how that works, allocate only areas that are filled by say with, uh, with cement and allocate these areas dynamically and fill the supercomputer also in a dynamic manner. Cheating with the parameters is a, a working way to actually in, in, improve um, the speed of the simulation. If the cement is more viscous, it would just move faster because it works at a different time scale. But this is cheating, right? 
If we do that, in the end, we don't know if we can trust the results or not. Use an enum homogeneous mesh to match the pore sizes. That's a method that works and that it is used in a computational fluid dynamics. But in this case, the porous structure of the bone is so complicated that working with inhomogeneous air meshes in the end just makes everything, in our case, even slower and not faster. So the solution which we chose, and I will go back to the presentation, the solution we chose was to allocate uh, areas uh, that, that are filled by cement. We are not interested in the bone uh, which is not filled by, by cement. So what we actually essentially do is we take the structure of uh, the bone and create the fluid, fluid, fluid meshes dynamically around the injected cement. And you see that here, it's a representation of the progress of the cement in our computer simulation and at the same time of the actually allocated memory during this computer simulation. So in the end, in the beginning, we have almost no memory and as the cement uh, floods into the bone, we uh, load pieces of, of, of bone from the, hard, from, from the hard drive and con construct as time goes the mesh dynamically. And by doing so, we use the resources of the computer more efficiently because we actually essentially uh, offload only pieces that are need needed or load them onto all the CPU cores of the parallel machine. So by doing this, you have, well, in black, you have the original curve, which showed how much injected uh, cement uh, we get as a fact, as a function of time. You have time on the x-axis, the amount of injected cement of, on the y-axis. To inject four milliliters, the black curve, that's the original curve, you need more than 30 hours. And if you do our dynamic allocation trick, you get to the uh, red curve, which reaches the same goal in 12 hours. And that's uh, much more realistic if you want to exchange in some manner with a patient and with a medical pra practitioner. So this is just to show you that uh, difficulties at different levels pop up and uh, must be solved when we do computational biomedicine. Uh, this is a webinar, the purpose, of, of, the purpose of which is to teach you something, but I showed you uh, lots of materials, which uh, most of them I did not do myself. So I want to refer to the Combiomed team here at the University of Geneva that includes Professor Bastien Chopard, Charlie, Francesco Marson, and Christos Kotsalos. And also the team at a company that uh, works on the numerical and small one method and the Palavos code. And that would, my thanks would go to Dimitrios Kontaksakis, to Orestes Malaspinas, to Andrea Di Blasio, and to Andy Kbao. Of course, this was just one hour. I cannot tell you everything in one hour. This was a little bit of a rush, maybe. And let me give you a link to the webpage of the software Palavos, on which you can download Palavos, but also get further resources. And a link to a course, which is more detailed, also longer, and gives a more uh, detailed introduction to the Lattice Boltzmann method. And that's it for me. So I will end my, uh, the webinar uh, now and give you some time to um, ask your questions and I'm here to answer them. So thank you, Jonas. Uh, so if there are any questions, uh, please raise your hand or type them in. Um, oh, yes, there's one question. Uh, from Niels Goodson. Goodson. Thanks for the very good introduction. Are you providing the slides uh, recording the sessions? Uh, so, uh, yes, we are. So, you can find them on the uh, webpage of the Combiomet. So, after, the, after this webinar, we will uh, put them online. Mm. So Any more questions? That... It seems that we are very mm -hmm. successful now. We, we, we answered in a very positive manner to the only question we got so far. Yeah. So, so then I think we can close the webinar. I really like to thank you again, Jonas, and uh, thank the attendees uh, for attending this webinar. So uh, all the slides and also the webinar recording will be uh, available on the Combiome at and the VPH uh, Institute webpage. Uh, and if you close this uh, webinar, there will pop up uh, a questionnaire. 
So uh, please fill in this questionnaire to help us improve the, the webinars. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Goodbye and thank you.